we're here for a very, very important session on impactful uh, careers. Uh, this panel will address the questions of how to develop a meaningful career that contributes both to the greater good and provides long-term financial stability. The panelists, who are all successful professionals in their own right, will offer tailored advice to those just starting out in the professional world on how they can be more effective altruists. And that's what makes us different. Uh, the format of the panel is as follows. Each panelist will have 10 minutes to introduce themselves, their organization, their work, and to share their perspective on the topic. After each panelist has had the chance to speak, I will moderate a discussion among the panelists, and then there, if is time remaining, and I expect there will, I will invite questions from the audience. And I have a few starter questions, but I know I don't, don't need that. Um, they're going to introduce themselves, and we're going to start from uh, my left, uh, stage right, uh, with uh, a fellow that looks familiar to me. And uh, everybody, uh, please welcome our speakers to Impactful Careers. Sir? All right, so my purpose is to try to interest a few of you in considering the becoming a professional assessor. An assessor's role is a professional job. I want to kind of give you my background to kind of give you some ideas of how you could get into it. Uh, first of all, I was a real estate major in college. So I had a real estate courses at, uh, when I was attending uh, San Diego State University. One of them was appraisal theory. And when I graduated, or before I graduated, I'd had the opportunity to see just how much revenue there was in land. And it was astonishing to see, you know, that, that the value of land was so great that, for example, in the state of California, it could fund all governments of, of the state and local level and still leave a large amount of money available for other purposes. So this got me to thinking about, you know, right now, or, or at that, that time, um, we were only collecting a limited amount of revenue from, from land. And it did make the most sense because it was efficient and because it was a, a source that could be readily used and applied. So I decided to take a look at the field of assessing. And to do that, I first of all became an appraiser. I got a job with a savings and loan. And during the first year I was working there, I was able to sign up for all the real estate courses at the University of California, Los Angeles Extension School. They had six courses on real estate appraisal and real estate theory. So while I was working, getting kind of interested in the whole field, um, I was get also getting my education. Well, after working for the savings and loan for a few years, I had an opportunity to take a trainee job at a county assessor's office. It was Sacramento County, California. And so I went to work there. Worked there for a while. When I had a call from a mayor of a small town in Michigan by the name of Southfield, Michigan. Uh, the mayor told me that uh, he had uh, just fired his assessor because the assessor had been told that the assessments were unbalanced and needed to be revalued. The land was assessed far too low and the buildings were not depreciated at all. And he said, would you consider coming to be the assessor of this town? And I said, yes, I certainly would. I, I said, I'm only 26 years of age, do you realize that? And he said, well, that, that's all right, you know, you at least have the background. So I went, and when I got there, I was one of the youngest people on the staff of about uh, 15 people that worked in the office. Um, so it was kind of a fun way to start my, my career. Uh, what we did in that town was to virtually, the assessments on the land were so bad that we were able to, on average, double the assessment of, on the land value just to bring it up to what it should be. And because the buildings had never been depreciated, we were able to apply depreciation for the age of the building and lower them quite a bit. The net effect was neutral revenue. We increased the land values by the same amount that we decreased the building values. 
So for the most part, when homeowners got their bills, they were pretty much the same, but we were able to collect a lot of new revenue from vacant land in particular. And at that time, the city only had about, um, about 16,000 people living there. It was small, and it had a good commercial center. It was adjacent to Detroit, um, well located. As a result of this, basically, very quickly, people understood that they better use their land more profitably, that the taxes were higher on those people that were inefficient users of land and those that had vacant land with no use. As a result, we saw enormous construction going on, and the city grew in population to uh, around 80,000 people. Uh, corporations were located there. We wound up with, with major corporations, several of them having world headquarters there, and other ones having um, regional headquarters there. And today, the city of Southfield is considered the business center of the state of Michigan, and is considered one of the more progressive cities um, in, the, in the Midwest. Um, I had a chance after being in Southfield of taking on the job of deputy county assessor in uh, Sacramento again, where I had also had my training. And from there I had an opportunity to go to, to become the assessor of Hartford, Connecticut. All along the way I was continuing my education, I was continuing my background um, I did have a chance at that point, though, to consider an opportunity to become a consultant to the province of British Columbia, Canada. Uh, there was a new government there that was looking for experts in different fields, uh, including auto insurance and other things that they wanted to reform, one of which was assessment. So I was given a one-year contract to set up a better assessment system for British Columbia. Uh, I met with the the leaders of assessment in the province, and within the one year that I was on my contract, we completely reorganized the assessment system. Instead of having 115 municipal assessors, um, we brought it down, broke it down to having 27 regional assessment districts. And we would have then a professional sized staff of typically around 30 people for each one of the districts. That way you would be able to get well-trained people to really do the job, get the job done right. It was considered probably one of the best assessment reforms that's ever been done anywhere in the world. And it continues today after many years. I went there in 1973, so it's been a long time since that system was set up. And it continues on today. And in, in British Columbia, more than half of all the revenue from the property tax comes from land. That was because we always put land first we always said that it was most important to be able to get as much revenue from land as was possible. And this was true in all the cities I've ever worked at. Um, from there, then I became a professional assessor for several years, working for Bank of America and for other banks. And during that time, I was given the opportunity of, of going with other Georges to work on setting up assessment systems in the former Soviet bloc uh, countries. We had a success in uh, Estonia, in particular Tallinn, Estonia, adopted a land assessment system that we had, uh, recommend, that we had put together for them. Uh, we also put together a, a system for Novgorod, Russia, and had also put together a system in Jamaica. Um, an interesting thing is that I was also offered a job in 19, 1991 uh, to, it was actually 1990, to actually set up the assessment, or set up the financial system for the city of St. Petersburg, Russia. And I was supposed to work with another fellow by the name of uh, Valdemar Putin in setting up their financial system. I turned down the job. Putin, of course, went on to become the president of the country of Russia, and I'm kind of glad I turned that job down. So I've kind of given you this background. My whole idea that I want to accomplish today is to get you interested in at least looking into this field. To me, it's been a lifetime experience. I've had so many opportunities, I've met so many people, and I can see the results of the work I've done. It's actually helped many, many places where I've worked. And so I'm encouraging you to also look into this as a field. I've done very well in British Columbia. Uh, overnight, uh, I inherited a staff of 765 people. 
and I had a salary that was commensurate with you know, the pay that a, a, a major manager would make. I was an assessment commissioner and deputy minister of finance in British Columbia for 13 years. And that was the, probably the highlight of my life, uh, the, real, the really best job I've ever had. So I'm encouraging you to at least look into this field. There are some wonderful opportunities, and I uh, would be glad to answer your questions about it at the end. Anyhow, uh, we have two PowerPoint presentations, I believe, and Sonia, do you have a? I don't. Okay, then you're in luck. So Philly's in the house. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Sonia uh, to uh, take over at this point and just describe what's, what's up. Thank you. Are the other two off? This is off. Okay. okay, all right, thank you so much, you guys. Thanks for having me. That was fascinating. I, it's a great idea. Um, I'm so excited to be on this panel because public speaking is part of my job and the thing that I normally talk about is interesting to me and important, but I also have been really looking forward to having an opportunity to talk about how I even got the job that I have now. So my name is Sonia Trous and my job now is politics. Um, sometimes when I go out of town, I tell people that I work in theater because I realized that politics is actually a matter of producing kind of very dull, very long running public, um, public stories, you know, public theater productions. Uh, I got into this basically by accident um, about three years ago. I felt very strongly that, you know, the Bay Area is a, is a growing place as we probably all have experienced, we have a housing shortage. And my goals actually wind up overlapping with Georgists and that I am also very interested in bringing land into productive use, um, one particular productive use, and that is housing. And I do want to take this opportunity to tell you guys, the reason that we have so much land underused in the Bay Area, it is not because of the, la of the laziness or greed of landowners. I promise you every landowner wants nothing more than to bring his or her land into its highest and best use and a lot of the time, they can't get the permit to do it. Even if it's zoned for something more productive than it's currently being used for, going to the city to say, can I have a permit to build you know, a four-story building here? The city will also want to say yes, but neighbors will come out of the woodwork you know, to, to make it impossible. Um, and so I saw this was a problem. I started organizing people that I knew Really, and when I say people, I mean like one or two other people. Very small numbers of people. If you have one or two friends that agree with you. Um, and we would go to public hearings. In particular, the Planning Commission in, in San Francisco. We would go on Thursday afternoons and just speak in favor of anything. You know, and it was a total surprise to everyone who was there because we were strangers. Um, there would be, you know, some NIMBYs and they would say, we don't want to, please don't build this. It would mean cutting down a tree that we like. And we would go and we would say, can you please build this? It's about 100 apartments. You know, 150 people can live there. Um, think of the 150 people who could live there as opposed to just listening to these three people who, you know, want to save a tree. So, it, you know, it all sort of happened very fast. That was like two and a half years ago. One thing, I mean, the main thing is luck. Um, so, yeah, I was able to quit my job because I was working really, really hard all the time. And there were people that saw value in my work. And I don't know if any of you were here for the previous speaker, but she was right on. Like when you are working hard and people see you work hard and your work has value to them, they will ask to give you money. Uh, and it's just about whether you're ready to accept it. Um, so if you have something that is your passion and if you have something that you know, puts you in like a high state of excitement that you want to work on all the time, uh, working hard all the time is really like, you have to have luck also and you have to have good ideas, but nothing is going to happen for you if you're not working all the time. That said, you have to also not burn out. So my rules for not burning out are stop working by 9 p.m. and try for 6 p.m. sometimes and take one day off of work. That you might recognize as also one of the Ten Commandments, which lets you know that like it's a popular idea at least and many other people have thought of it. 
Um, my, my job today like really was made possible by some epiphanies. Is anybody here like in their late 20s? Okay, let me tell you, turning 30 at first might not feel good, but your 30s, 30s are the best. Your 30s are the best time of your life because you are, sm okay, well listen, I'm happy to hear it. I'm 34, so so far this has been it. This is the biz. Because like, uh, you're not as dumb as you are anymore you know, in your 20s, but you're young enough to still be able to do everything you want to do. Um, so I realized I like, got really, really depressed when I was 30. I actually consider it kind of a psychedelic experience because the depression was tied to the fact that I was like going off, sorry, some long-term um, antidepressants. And as it turns out, if anybody here is on Lexapro or anything like that, you go off it, Six months later, you might experience like a new hell that you have never known before. That's part of the withdrawal. So I don't regret going on. I don't regret going them off. I just want everyone to know about that. Uh, but so during that like two, three week lowest point, I realized a few things. One of them is that all of life is a duocracy all the time. It's not just when you're participating at Noise Bridge. You know, that anything that you can see that needs being done, if no one's do it, you can always just do it. You don't need to ask for permission. Related, no one's in control and there's nothing out there. And nothing really matters. So those sound kind of pessimistic, but like really realizing that, like really realizing that there is no one to give you permission to do anything. And honestly, nobody who really can give you advice. Um, it inspired an incredible feeling of like motivation and freedom. Um, Machiavelli says in The Prince, only a wise man gets good advice. Which means that at the end of the day, like you, it's all, the only thing is you. Like you have to decide to take whatever advice you get. You have to decide to learn from whatever experiences you have. And you have to decide what advice or experiences aren't representative and aren't worth learning from. Yeah, so that's all, ha all you have. There's no way out of that. Um, so those are my main pieces of advice for having the, the, the job that you want. Um, I don't know about long-term financial security. I, have, I did incorporate a C3. Um, I am paying myself right now. I am not sure that I'll be doing this in two or three years, and I don't mind. I think that that's fine. I'll just do something else. Thanks. So I'd like to introduce Miss Jessica Robinson and well, take it away, Jessica. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Robinson. I'm also known as Miss Alameda Recycle Woman and Resilience. I have many names. Um, but I am a I'm a part of the zero waste movement. I'm a climate leader and I believe that zero waste is part of the solution to addressing climate change. Um, so I am a Bay Area native. I was I grew up and I was raised in the Bay Area. Um, I grew up in Alameda. Went to the, um, all schools in Alameda. Went to the University of San Francisco. Graduated um, with a degree in performing arts and social justice. And then I landed out in the real world. And I'm like, now what? Um, my degree was brand new at the university, but it seems to work with me because I'm also an artist and I believe in. Um, making a difference, and when I was younger and I was in high school, I thought maybe I might be in politics, but then I also thought, well, I want to own my own company. And so social justice and performing arts was like the political and the theater, so to me, it, it made sense. So I did it. And then it was just like, what's next? Um, well, pursuing my acting career, um, I got this, this uh, um, what I want to say, it's, uh, it was like a little bulletin about becoming uh, Miss California, and I was like, yeah, right, I'm not pageant material, um, but then it kept on popping up in my inbox, and I really wanted to just be an actress, and then so I just submitted yes to it, because, hey, who would want to turn down $100,000, because that was a prize, and sure enough, um, I ended up qualifying and becoming Miss Alameda, um, and that's where my journey began, because it was actually the pageant experience and thinking that I needed the crown in order to help save the world, um, which I really truly believed, I actually discovered this, this, 
this saying that my grandmother and everybody else had been telling me about the present moment, right? Um, it's the journey, it's not the destination. And I realized that I wanted to not just be a voice on stage, but to actually walk my talk. And so um, my platform as Miss Alameda became my drive. Um, Miss Alameda says compost. That was, that was my initial platform about being sustainable and helping my community, the city of Alameda, address climate change since we are an island and we are threatened by sea level rise. And one of the easiest things to do is getting organics out of the landfill. I thought, I thought when I um, bumped into CASA, Community Action for Sustainable Alameda, which is my mother organization and where my, I met my mentor, Ruth Abbey, I thought she was giving me a pair of diapers and was like, here, Miss Alameda, go get organics out of the landfill. And I was like, are you kidding me? I want to get the plastic gyre out of the ocean. This is nothing. And then I realized, oh, this is actually something. So one by one, getting restaurants to recycle and compost, getting the schools to recycle and compost. I endorsed our Green Schools Challenge. And then reaching out to the community, I realized actually this is a hard, this is something that's not easy to do because we're actually trying to create cultural and social change. We're actually trying to get people to break habits of either littering or just throwing everything in one bin and forgetting about it and actually bringing attention to this issue. So I had my work cut out for me and then I became absolutely obsessed with love of trying to make a difference. And um, in, what was it? 2013, I got an award, a Climate Hero Award from the city of Alameda right after I burned out and I got shingles. I have to tell you, um, in this journey of doing my environmental advocacy and working in the community, I have found the value of meditation. It has really helped me um, manage my stress because I can tell you, being passionate and wanting to make a difference can also be very stressful, especially when you have to deal with politics and stubborn people and just challenges. It can, it can really take a toll sometimes. So being able to release um, energy and finding your centeredness is, it's, I can't even express the value of that. So anyways, back to my story. I got an award because um, by 2013, we were able to, um, we were able to, uh, compost and reduce methane gas emissions by, I think, 1,300 tons just by the restaurants that we got on my program, which was helping the city of Alameda address this climate protection plan that they um, had adopted in 2008 to get our levels down, I think, what is it, 25% uh, from our emissions in 2005. Anyways, we were on track from the program. It was a big deal. And we're doing much more than that now. Um, but that was a huge milestone for me. And that was like equivalent of removing 242 cars off the road. I mean, I was, I was pretty excited over that number. Um, but anyways, one of the main issues for me about, about recycling and composting is that if we don't, if we throw away food waste in the landfill, if any of you understand or believe in climate change um, and greenhouse gas emissions, when food waste goes into landfill, it turns into methane gas, which is one of the most harmful greenhouse gases that we know of, and it stays in the atmosphere for 20 years or so. So it's really important just to remove our compostables at landfill. It's so easy. It's very simple. And, um, and then recycling. We're saving our natural resources. I'm sure I'm probably sp speaking to the choir right now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a big deal. And... Um, so anyways, my passion, I wanted to get this message out to people, and so I decided, yay, to incorporate my theater, my, my acting, what my passion, the reason why I even got in this mess in the first place. So I turned um, my platform into a superhero, Recycle Woman, and I made a little short film just to bring more attention to it and also to prove it to my grandma that I wasn't giving up on my dream as an actress as I became obsessed. And then everybody was like, you should bring this to Al Gore. He needs to know about this. He needs to endorse it. So I was like, yeah. So then I became a climate leader. And uh, that's me right there. And that's Mr. Gore. And um, I even was so, so brave enough to jump in front of his bodyguards just to give him my DVD. It scared living daylights out of me, and I'm sure it scared everybody else. Um, and then after that, I um, started going into schools and started teaching kids about recycling and composting, and I absolutely love that. I love empowering young kids, young youth, and getting them to be their own superheroes and to be leaders in their own communities and their classrooms, and it's, it's really, truly fulfilling. And, um, and then I decided I need to get this out 
to the world. So I have morphed into resilience because I realized after becoming a climate leader and really trying to understand the depth of climate change and how it impacts the Bay Area, I realized that my message goes much deeper than recycling and composting. It really goes into sustainability, into understanding our community, understanding our needs, and understanding how to find the balance and how to be resilient and how to adjust, because that is something that we're gonna have to do when we address climate changes. We're gonna have to adjust. Um, the planet's going to change, everything is, I mean, everything is changing. I mean, I don't know if any of you have grown up or raised in the Bay Area like me, but the climate here in the Bay Area has definitely changed changed from when I was a little kid. It's not the same, it's not normal. Um, anyways, um, so I turned Resilience Birthright um, into a nonprofit. I, have, I officially have a 501c3. Um, I'm creating a graphic novel that's gonna turn into a television show. So my graphic novel, think Batman, Superman, um, Wonder Woman, all of those things, but then also reflecting reality. Um, and so graphic novel, I also want it to be very beautiful because I'm artistic. And um, that's my story. If you want to know more about what I'm doing, what's going on, the graphic novel, um, I also have documentaries that just kind of go more into the basics and also infrastructure that we have here in the Bay Area that can help us address and solve climate change by just our own individual actions as well as community development and coalitions. If you're interested in all that information, go ahead and text uh, uh, RB for July to 97000. Anyways, I will connect you to uh, the work, and I promise I won't spam you. Um, and yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, great. And I'm, I'm detecting a trend, and I think it's going to continue with our next uh, presentation. And it's, there's a PowerPoint. Yeah, I, th I think we're going to get uh, going pretty quickly. I did want to start because I saw some uh, relationships here between all, all of our speakers, and I think we're going to hear it from Andres when we get this done, is that all three of you seem to have a life, a personal life interest that intersected with politics. And most people hate politics, I believe. But... Why is it that politics seem to be the avenue that all three of you, and I bet four, uh, became the avenue? Why politics? Uh, ladies? Ted? Well, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't intend to get entangled in politics, but I realized that's where you make change. Even on a local level in Alameda, you have to work with your city government. You have to work with all the contractors, I mean, if it's even something simple as getting people to compost, right? Someone has to pick up the service, um, someone has to oversee the local hauler and make sure that they're actually doing their job, right? There's all these checks and balances. Like, you, at some point, I think in anything that we do, there's politics and that we, in order to make anything happen, we have to work with other people. Um, and making local change you do have to deal with your with your local government and so it's just I think that's just the beast when it comes to doing something big even if it's something big locally it's just right. Sonia what do you think yeah polit politics is awesome I don't know why anyone would not like politics um it's it it does it mediates Every, it mediates everything we do with other people. I mean, if you are only having a project with two or, two or three other people, then that's that. But anything that you want to do that you think you're going to affect a lot of people, I mean, the way that the, the sort of channel along, with, along which that um, effort travels is politics. So even if it's not something explicitly political, right, there are some people who are activist shareholders. That's an example of people who are like doing politics uh, but not with respect to like a government, um, or even if you're if you're organizing workers, right? That's politics. But you're not organizing people to vote necessarily. You might be organizing people to strike, or organizing people to have some interaction with respect to you know your um, your employer. All of those are politics because politics is what we call any activity where you're trying to interact with like hundreds of people at once. I think. What do you think? Okay. All right. Now, he's a rock star, so he's going to do a stand-up. All right. You're on. You're on. 
Uh, all right. Cool. Uh, yes. So I'm Andres uh, Gomez Samuelson, former president of the Stanford Transhumanist Association, and I currently work uh, at a startup in the city uh, called Kenjoya. And basically, Kenjoya's mission is to make uh, people who work uh, as happy as possible. Uh, we offer a full engagement solution. Basically, we can analyze people's uh, how interested they are at work and basically what kind of things actually makes them uh, like thrilled to go to work every day. Um, likewise, uh, we also try to basically predict that over time and also analyze open-ended questions. Um, so I do happen to have some first-hand experience with actually what makes people happy uh, at work, uh, or at least they, something that will make people say that they are happy at work. Uh, okay, so the, the, the first thing I want to sort of define is what is an impactful career? So I will define impact to basically be the multiplication of these two components. The first one is the utilitarian factor or the mean utilitarian factor. That is, on a given unit of time, how much impact your career actually has. And because we are effective altruists, we don't only care about whether something looks good. We actually care about the a precise amount of impact that we have and, and, and how positive it is. And the other component is basically how long you can sustain that. So obviously, burning out very quickly, even though you might have like an extraordinarily um, high utilitarian score career, if you burn out right away, then that's not an impactful career. So yes, impact is just the multiplication of these two things. How long can you carry your uh, high, high, high utilitarian score career? Uh, an important note is that actually, uh, over time, the utilitarian score of your particular activities will change, and in many careers, you may actually experience some kind of dip at the very beginning, so you have to take that into account as well. Uh, the previous uh, s graph sort of was uh, assuming an equal amount of uh, uh, utilitarian score over time, but really, you just have to take the integral. That's, that's what matters uh, in this case. Um, and in terms of like research for job satisfaction, there is this is an extraordinarily large uh, academic area. Um, tens of thousands of papers have been written about what is job satisfaction and how to measure it. But uh, I'm going to tell you a, a model that I like a lot because it's as simple as it gets, and it gets to actually what matters. Uh, it accounts for about 60% of the variance of whether people report that they are satisfied with their job. And these are basically a model that it's composed of two components. So the first one is meaningfulness, whether you think your job is actually meaningful and, and matters for the world. And the second one is the absence of stress, or in the flip side is occupational stress. Uh, these two th factors combined already account for, as I said, 60% of the variance of how much people like their job. So, so they're really important. Now, a very interesting thing is that we can actually map uh, these two factors in affect space or emotional space. And this is what emotional space looks like. This is uh, called the circumplex model. Basically, it accounts as well, incidentally, for about 60% of the variance in variability of emotion across time. And it's composed of two axes. So the first one is valence. That is the pleasure-pain axis, how, how pleasant your experience is in a given point. The zero basically means it's neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Uh, and the other axis is arousal, or what some people call activation. That is how much energy there is in, in, your, in your conscious system at a given point in time. And the really cool thing is that we can actually map these two dimensions that matter for job satisfaction into the uh, core affect space. Um, the first one, meaningfulness, is actually this diagonal. Basically, things that make you excited and, and make you anticipate uh, like new, new experiences in the future. Um, so meaningfulness has this like, diagonal interpretation in, in core affect space. Um, whereas absence of stress has the other diagonal, uh, basically that is moving from uh, states of anxiety, such as occupational stress, into serenity and calm, uh, blissful feelings that don't have much energy. Um, 
And basically, if your job is fostering these two diagonals, is on the one hand, it's giving you things to make you excited about, and on the other hand, is allowing you relaxation, then th that's a good chance that actually that's going to be a, a work you will be satisfied with. Um, a very interesting uh, caveat and note to point out is that meaningfulness is subjective, and it depends on your background assumptions. Um, so <laughs> let me tell you a good news that could be interpreted as bad, and that is that if you are infected with the effective altruist meme, your bar for meaningfulness is a lot higher. So basically, what perhaps for a person could be meaningful, it might not be meaningful after they learn about effective altruism, because they think, oh, gosh, I have all of these other options that I could be pursuing that may have a hundred or a thousand times higher impact. So if you know about effective altruism, your meaningfulness is going to be screwed, but is good for the world. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit more about emotion. Actually, the core affect space is really interesting, the, the valence and arousal, because it was originally designed to uh, basically identify dimensions in emotions that are uncorrelated with each other, so that you can find any emotion that is in, in, in any part of that space. Now, a, a very interesting discovery in 2007 by, by Kupens was that um, these dimensions are actually uh, uncorrelated in the aggregate, but in individual people, they are not uncorrelated. And there's basically three class of people. Um, there is people who basically, whenever they experience uh, pleasant emotions, they are in a relaxed state, or like low arousal state. And conversely, they bounce back in the other direction and feel stressed and, and, uh, and anxious uh, when, when they feel bad. Uh, 30% of people are the opposite. Whenever The only way they, they know how to feel good is through excitement and anticipation, and the only way they know how to feel bad is through uh, depression and feelings of doom. Uh, and about 40% of people are uh, in the middle. So it's, it, this is a profound human uh, variability, uh, and it explains a lot of uh, personality uh, to, to a large extent, basically what kind of things people pursue as rewarding activities. Um, so this is something that is very useful to actually know your, about yourself, so that you can actually sort of like know what, what kind of uh, job would actually be, be, be good for you in terms of job satisfaction. Um, there's actually a, a, a whole sort of like new outgrow of, of research that, that was brought, out, brought on by that discovery, where people actually started modeling uh, transitions in the core affect space using, using uh, hierarchical latent uh, stochastic differential equations. It basically just treating our movement in this space uh, as, as some kind of like physical system that has an attractor point at the center that is always pushing you towards that, that area. Um, this is basically a way of math making mathematical and formalizing the hedonic thread meal, where it, it really doesn't matter how much you try to go up or left or right. Um, there's like strong biochemical and biological forces that, is, that are pushing you back towards your own center. And here's the sad thing, people's centers are different. And to a large extent, there might uh, be a strong um, er early developmental and genetic reasons uh, th that explain the particular particular hedonic set point, or the average, that you're converging towards. Um, and you can see as well in there, um, these, are, these are sort of like mapping the, um, as a dynamic system, where, wherever you are, where is your biological system pushing you? So if you're like in, in high activation and low pleasantness, there's a strong uh, push towards the center, and, and so on. Um, yeah, and uh, there, there's actually um, so, some research that I did uh, on my master's uh, actually goes even deeper and basically models uh, the state space of emotion uh, in its entirety, and it turns out that particular emotional words have a lot more information than core affect, but uh, which actually implies that there are some interesting emotion clusters uh, and attractors that are independent of core affect. But for the most part, they don't really matter for job satisfaction because they only account for like up to 10% of the variance. So don't worry about it, but this is the full picture. Um, yes, and emotional dissonance is basically, as you know, cognitive dissonance is the difference between your beliefs and actions. Emotional difference is the difference between 
uh, the, your inner and projected affect, and it turns out that that's very important for job satisfaction. When you're pretending that you're in an emotion that you're not, uh, that actually is very draining and, and, and very hard. Uh, so you have to take that into account. And basically, just to wrap up, uh, my claim is that for effective altruists, uh, we are very lucky that job satisfaction is the same as impact, and I can demonstrate it this way. Basically, this diagonal, uh, if meaningfulness uh, for you is basically how much you actually matter in the world, that's going to map to mean utilitarian score, and low stress will map to the duration of your career, and therefore, they're the same thing. Um, and yes, as a summary, if you're an effective altruist, basically you're lucky in the sense that job satisfaction will come from impactful careers. So look for impactful careers. Don't worry about job satisfaction. That will come automatically. Thank you. Great, great job. Uh, I'm going to moderate myself. We're just gonna take a Q and A from the audience uh, and we will start right there, sir. When you said take one day off, was that per week, month, year? Yeah, one day per week. That's my recommendation. And it's hard. I mean, it's um, also, Jessica talked about it. Uh, you kind of have to be disciplined um, with taking off. To force yourself to do it. And uh, Nate? Uh, this one's for Sonia. Um, I think maybe we've talked about this before, but I think you make a mistake in asserting that all owners of land or vacant lots in the city want to or have a strong interest in building something useful there. Uh, just because every time somebody proposes a building, a bunch of NIMBYs come out and, and protest or oppose it, doesn't necessarily mean that all the, the, the landlords that are silent and they don't hear from aren't perfectly happy with that situation. Yeah, that's true. I mean, statements that start with all are like always wrong, right? Um, but uh, I do think that the, if we, if we had by right development, our problem with uh, land laying fallow would be much, much less. I mean, if, I guess what I'm trying to say, if your goal is to have as little land laying fallow as possible, there are many, many um, public policy uh, sort of levers, and one of them that would yield a lot of really great result is reforming entitlement. But yeah, sure. I mean, there's definitely, Prop 13 makes it really easy to sit on land forever. I was actually, a guy just emailed me, long email, just, just describing exactly that. He's like, it's insane. There's no, I should, I should have redeveloped this 20 years ago, and there's no reason for me to redevelop it. I mean, redevelop it, yeah, so, yeah, you're right. The answer is there are many, many uh, female assessors. Uh, in fact, I would almost say that half of the assessors in the United States are female. Uh, and they do some of the best work. Um, some of the fem female assessors in Connecticut, Connecticut, where I worked my last um, 10 years of assessing, uh, were innovative. They brought in new ideas, new methodologies, and they were professional and they were respected for the innovation that they brought in. So the answer to your question is definitely yes. It's a very good field for female workers. And working for government agencies, they're very interested in fairness, having many females in top positions. So it's a good, it's a good opportunity really, really for a lady to get involved with a very positive career. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. So I have a question this time is, um, about meaningfulness of careers. Yeah. And I love the simplicity of how to choose a career. Find something that's impactful, the rest of the stuff sort of falls in place. What do you say? I cannot think of an industry that's more impactful than healthcare. And we're constantly collecting this employee satisfaction survey. And even though it's such an impactful it's usually, so what I'm essentially coming to is that there's several things I'm wondering how we would be to 
Yeah, uh, the company I work for basically uh, it creates tools to identify uh, any kind of problem in, in, in uh, jobs in the corporate world and even in, in, in public. And um, yes, there, there's like very specific problems that can actually cause tremendous uh, decays in job satisfaction. I mean, just to give you an example, the presence of a psychopath or um, a, a person who, who literally has no empathy uh, in, in one's working team is actually associated with a tremendous drop in, in job satisfaction. Like, there are very specific things that, that do that, but in the absence of sort of like a glaring problem, 60% uh, of what matters is accounted for by lack of stress and that you judge the, the work to be meaningful. Um, there's like some interesting uh, data as well, for example, for um, like teachers and, and doctors for whom the, the work is, is, is very meaningful. Um, but at the same time, those jobs uh, usually come with the very high levels of stress. So uh, usually that's kind of the, the, the part that, um, yeah, comp compensates um, um, and pushes job satisfaction down. And yes, it is also often the case that many of the punctual problems that, that can be identified also fall into one of the two categories. Either it's affecting meaningfulness directly or it's affecting uh, occupational stress directly. Um, I think that education is very important. Um, uh, you really have to be an appraiser, a qualified appraiser, and that may involve taking a trainee job and also attending university. After, after you have a, a, a graduate de degree, you then have to get into specialized courses. Uh, I, I became an MAI, which is a member of the American Institute of Real Estate Appraisers, and that was considered the, the, the top uh, top designation and, and the, uh, the top of the field. And that's recognized. When you go for a job with that kind of a, a, a designation after your name, it means something. In terms of opportunities, um, in California, each county has an assessor and assessor's staff. Because of Proposition 13, uh, they're limited on what they can do. I know that when we were in Sacramento County, it was before the Proposition 13 came up and we were able to update the assessments quite a bit. In terms of getting a job today in an assessor's office, the opportunities come up. Uh, if, if you're in another state, uh, it's, it's probably greater opportunities because uh, they're able to do more in many states. Uh, but I, you, you look for the jobs as they come up. Uh, the International Association of Assessing Officers uh, posts the job availabilities nationally and by uh, looking on their website, you're able to then see if there are any jobs that are being posted in the area that you live or that you'd like to live. Uh, in terms of your salary, um, it, it's fairly good. I would say that um, assessors probably make certainly as much as planners and certainly as much as professionals do in city government. Um, it's not at all uncommon to see assessors making over $100,000 and uh, depending upon the size of the, of the group. The appraisers themselves typically are making fifty or $60,000 as you know, right, right almost right from the beginning, and they move up as time goes on. So those are, the, those are the possible opportunities where to look for jobs and what you might expect in terms of compensation. Okay, I think we are unhappily done. We could go on a long time, but I'd like to thank our panel. Thank you very much.